Hi, this is Rick. Let's talk about basic computer theory. This is how computers work. Now, we're not going to talk about a specific computer. This is pretty generic for all computers. So we have to realize that basic computer theory involves people. So we are the interface that determines how that computer works. So here we go. Um, you'll notice when we start off, uh, computers are very, very simple. That's the first principle you have to understand about computers. I mean, they only speak two words, ones and zeros, yes or no, true or false, plus five volts and zero. It depends on the discipline that you're involved in. So, for example, if, um, if you're in engineering, then it's plus five volts and zero. All right. If um, you are um, in a logic class, then it's true or false. In our particular case, it's going to be true or false. So, computers are very, very simple. The other thing you have to know is that computers are very stupid. So when you get in there and realize that they're very simple and they're very stupid, then you're not afraid of them because they're not going to take over the world. I hate to tell you that, but all those science fiction movies are still fiction. As we get in here, we want to teach you how computers really work. Actually, computers consist of two parts, hardware and software. So we're going to take a look at each one of those, how hardware works and how software works. First of all, how does hardware really work? Well, hardware really works in a very simple way. Input process, output. So we input something, then the computer processes it, and then it outputs it. Now, if you don't have any input, nothing happens. If you don't have any output, no matter what you did, doesn't matter. So all three have to be there. And you can think of a lot of different examples of this. For example, you can think of a car. Uh, you put in gasoline. That's the input. You process it in the engine, and the engine produces power and torque, and that torque is output in your wheels. So input, process, output. The best example I can think of input, process, and output is this. If you've never changed a diaper, you're missing a part of your life learning. Okay, let's talk about input. Think of some input devices. Um, input devices include uh, touch screen, keyboard, mouse, maybe uh, your internet connection. Um, it could be a microphone like I'm using now. So there's a lot of input devices. Once we have that input, then we're going to take whatever we produced or whatever we had and we're going to process it. And the way we're going to process it is in, inside the computer called the processing unit and that's called the central processing unit. It's a CPU is what, the way it's normally shortened. So a CPU is basically the brains of the computer. Now I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that is kind of shocking. First of all, most CPUs can only do three things. They can only add, subtract, and compare. That's it. They have to have a special arithmetic unit to do anything else. But when you think of it, multiplying is simply adding very quickly and dividing is simply subtracting very quickly and that's what, mostly what we do. The CPU is also the one that actually instruments or, or, or coordinates the running of the computer and this is what that, cord, that chip may look like. It's, it's kind of different looking if you looked inside a computer. It's got a lot of connections and it's, uh, it's the little brain. It's what you buy and pay for. It's got megahertz and gigahertz associated with it as far as speed goes and things like that. All right, let's talk about the second part in that processing, and that's called RAM. RAM is short for random access memory. It means we can go in and grab anything out of any place in the memory. It's kind of where the programs play. It's kind of where your data runs and is calculated. And if a program is running, it's in RAM. And this is what RAM looks like. It's kind of those chip things. Uh, get as much RAM in your computer <laughs> as possible. And if you didn't get enough, buy more and put it in there. You need as much RAM or playground space as you can. Now the third area down here is called storage and there are two kinds of storage. The storage is basically a bucket that holds things on a permanent basis. So the first thing we think of is your hard drive. That's considered external storage. And that external storage is probably one of the most magnificent inventions uh, of the last century. It is just phenomenal. Now remember that we said the computer only speaks two words plus five volts and zero or true and false one and zero whatever it is but the idea behind storage is that 
a magnet only has two poles, north and south. So let's make north equal to zero and south equal to one. And now you see how that magnetic disk can spin and hold data. And that little arm there is actually what goes in and grabs it. It's, it's a magnificent system. The fact that it can go in to the innermost ring, find out where your data is stored, and then jump out and get it so fast is, is just a miracle. It's amazing to me. And that's why this is actually the, one of the most astonishing inventions of the last decade or last century. Oftentimes we deal with other external storage like a USB drive. That's where it actually plugs into the USB port and we store it. And it doesn't, USBs don't have a battery because it uses a principle called piezoelectric to hold all those charges. So that's input process and now let's talk about output. Output is going to come in the form of a printout. The most common is your screen. That's actually where you're looking at Right now, you're looking at a monitor or your screen to your computer, and that's its primary output device. Let's talk about how they really run. So we have a program, and it's loaded on our hard drive, and it's not doing anything. By the way, it's not running when it's there. It can't. It's just stored there. If we wanted to run that program, then we would actually take a copy of it, and we'd load it into RAM. So we'd say, there's our input. We take a copy of the program, and we put it into RAM, which is dynamic, the random access memory, and now we can actually do something with it. So we can process. So the RAM and the CPU work together in the processing to actually make things happen and, and you know change the, the spelling and things like that. It actually runs the program. They work together. Once they've done their job, then we output to a device like the printer. That's basically how our hardware works. Input, process, output. Let's take a look at how software really works. Software is one of those things that uh, is kind of mysterious. So uh, we, we start with our computer hardware. We're, we're familiar with that. This is a picture of those RAM chips again. And the computer hardware runs the software. So hardware is stuff that you can actually touch. Software is a set of instructions. That's when we write a program. It's just a set of instructions telling the hardware what to do. That really doesn't have any basis unless it has an operating system in there, and every computer has an operating system. For example, your phone has an operating system. Your tablet has an operating system. Your car has an operating system. Uh, there are several Samsung refrigerators that have an operating system. And an operating system is defined as software that controls the hardware. That's important to write down. An operating system is software that controls the hardware. Now, an analogy might be um, when, when I was a kid, uh, my best friend's name was Randy. And uh, when I went over to Randy's house, it was really kind of cool. But Randy didn't live close. So if I got a call that I was going to spend the night at Randy's house, I was really thrilled. And I'd go in and I'd get all my stuff that we were going to play with. You know, my, my Lincoln Logs and my toys and my Dinky Toys and all that stuff. And I, sometimes I took clothes too. And, but I packed them up in my satchel and I was all ready to go. But you know something? I didn't get there. Because, see, I, I, I only packed up my bag. I couldn't do the rest of the job. See, Mom was the one that was going to make it happen. It took my part and it took her part. Because Mom controlled the hardware. So, because Mom owned the vehicle. She knew how to drive. She knew where Randy's house was. And she knew the laws that governed our getting there safely. So... Computer hardware works with the operating system. The operating system tells the computer hardware what to do. It's software that controls the hardware. Running on top of that is the part that we see, and that's the application. So let's go through what really happens when we run a program. So we're, we're sitting here running a program, and somebody thinks, you know, I think I need a printout. I need to have this on paper. So they go to the program, and they go to File, Print. Ta-da! That's pretty standard on most programs. So they go file print. Now, file print in the program is for us. That's for people. Unfortunately, the computer doesn't say file print and understand what that means. It doesn't understand file print at all. So the program actually sends to the operating system, ta-da! LPrint, and then the name of the document that we want printed out. So the program translates for the operating system. The operating system now is going to interface or work with a thing called the BIOS chip, which is actually the hardware that we're going to work with. And the hardware that we're going to work with gets this from the operating system. 
So the operating system takes lprintreport.doc and translates it into a memory position from here to here and send it out that hole which is called LPT1 because the hardware knows that's where that's what's connected to the hardware and the operating system knows that that's the right port to send out to the printer. And then the printer gets this, which is basically binary. That CA at the end is a hexadecimal piece, but uh, that's what gives us our printout. And that's how hardware and software basically work. <laughs>